Hello, attendees of the Institute of Medical Herbalists National Conference. I'm Dr. Harris Mumtaz, and here's Dr. Adam Saidi, and we would love to present our journey of discovering herbal medicine. To properly tell the story, we have to take you back to the very beginning. We hope you enjoy. When you're brought up in a working class area, well-being is one of the last things on your mind. You don't think about whether the food you're putting into your body is actually nutritious. You don't think about how many unpronounceable additives, stabilizers or preservatives you've just ingested. You don't think about the importance of phytonutrients, minerals and vitamins. You just want to eat. My mother always kept me and my ravenous brothers fed. Playing any sports I could growing up meant I was a hungry boy. I didn't really care what I ate as long as I could stuff my face after a physical game of rugby or athletics training. Full pizza to myself? Yes please. Burger and chips? I'll take that. My mum and grandma would mostly cook me beautifully flavoured Pakistani dishes growing up. With a range of herbs and spices I never truly appreciated until I became older. Yet this was frequently interspersed with cereal, bread, pizza, sweets and fizzy drinks. Had they have known how damaging these food types are, they would have never given me them. They were fooled by the misinformation and targeted advertising created by the billion dollar food industry. Could I have reached the highest echelons of professional sport with the right nutrition? Nah, probably not. However, that's not the point. What I'm trying to say is something much deeper. But before I get into it, Adam, let's hear your story. Oh no, it's that time again. An early night does nothing to prevent the will to stay in bed just a few minutes longer. A quick brush of the teeth and a bite to eat and it's off to a 90 minute morning training session. As I got older, I had to make my own way to morning training. My mum told me the cycle would instill a whatever it takes attitude needed to make it as a professional athlete. I think she was just tired of the early mornings. Growing up as a student athlete requires a few important characteristics, even if you don't realise you possess them at the time. Discipline, commitment, and a lack of social life spring to mind, the swim life trifecta. Couple this with a mighty love of the sport, and you've got the perfect combination. Still better than drinking on street corners, I suppose. Although the training was relentless, and Friday afternoon class doubled up as nap time. I wouldn't exchange this part of my life for anything. You get used to the early mornings and tired afternoons. There's nothing like two hours of staring at a black line to sort your issues out. Life stresses don't seem so bad after that. I always loved the post-workout glow. You quickly learn to appreciate the headspace this sort of training brings. It was at this point in the day when I felt most alive. Nutrition, however, was a bit more problematic. For a single parent to three hungry children, it was more a matter of surviving rather than thriving. Although we never went hungry, meals were fortified with reduced bread, sugar-laden donuts, and Danish pastries. Don't get me wrong, I loved this at the time, but it was simply a matter of calories in versus calories out. And there are much cheaper and tastier ways of consuming fibre and fat than walnuts, flax and chia seed. Millions of families up and down the country and around the world have been manipulated by the food industry. They've been manipulated into thinking that the food that they're buying is good for them and their family. Go into any supermarket and do the following. Analyse what goods are placed near the entrance, near the tills and at eye level in the aisles. These are the goods the supermarket want you to buy. And unsurprisingly, this is always ultra-processed foods that provide the shops with the highest profit margins. Simply put, healthy food isn't as profitable as unhealthy food. And the supermarkets know this all too well. The trend in obesity rates in both men and women from 1980 to 2021 show some concerning figures, almost reaching epidemic proportions. In 1980, 
obesity wasn't normalized, with only 6% of men and 8% of women classified as obese. In 2021, the figures show between 27 and 29% of all men and women in the UK are classified as obese. The food industry knows that energy dense foods with huge fat and carbohydrate contents are cheaper than fruit, whole grains and vegetables. This is tricking the layman into consuming unhealthy products as they are cheaper and often tastier than their fresh counterparts. The advent of technology hasn't really helped as it's become a lot easier to adapt to a sedentary lifestyle. The impact of deprivation on obesity rates is even more alarming. The rate of childhood obesity in the most deprived areas is more than double that of the least deprived, and no wonder. A packet of frozen sausages, processed hot dogs, or a loaf of white bread seems a lot more appealing price-wise and time-wise than buying the ingredients required for a healthy and nutritious meal. It takes knowledge to break away from this misinformation. Knowledge truly is power, so why, despite access to knowledge being at our fingertips, do we still seem to be so misinformed? So, when we got to medical school, we thought all our questions would be answered. We went through first year, learning all about human anatomy. Second year taught us complex biochemistry, and even more human anatomy. Third year soon came around, and we were thrust into hospital, shadowing doctors and seeing patients putting the theory into practice. Throwing multiple flayed blood samples, dodgy cannulas, never-ending medical grilling from the consultants, many, many embarrassing moments, and we made it through these early years. It was at this point where we first encountered the unhealthy habits of a modern society and the true consequences of addiction to alcohol, smoking and drugs. Seeing patients suffering with diabetic ulcers, abscesses and limb amputations was the stuff of nightmares. And after this, the experience and impact of our life choices seemed all the more real. We'd somehow gotten to fourth year, knowing a lot, yet at the same time so little. With this came the sad realization that although we'd learnt a lot about how to cure disease, we'd barely been taught about how to prevent it. In all honesty, we could probably count on both hands how many hours we actually spent learning about the importance of nutrition as a medicine. Of course, we were taught about exercising more, reducing alcohol consumption, and quitting smoking. But you don't need to pay over £9,000 a year for a medical degree to know that. We were being taught by some of the most experienced medical professionals in the world about weird and wonderful genetic diseases that are so rare we may only see them once in our lifetime. It just didn't make sense. Where was the focus on prevention and lifestyle? I was a bit dismayed at this lack of education, so I decided to take things into my own hands. When we were given an opportunity to choose a module to study, I picked a module titled Complementary Therapy and Alternative Medicine. Little did I know at the time that this decision would change my life. During this module, I was given the opportunity to experience a range of therapies and philosophies that were completely new to me. It was here that I first experienced the world of herbal medicine, which was incredible. I had no idea of how many modern medicines were derived from the natural plants. Discovering the history of how our species had utilised the environment around us to manage their health was inspiring, igniting what has now become an area of medicine I love. Through many delicious practicals, I learnt about the importance of diet and nutrition. These factors drive so much of the chronic diseases overwhelming the NHS. So I was really pleased to finally be able to cover these subjects. Then there was the powerful effects of meditative practices and exercise, which are talked about so much yet practiced so poorly. I finished the module invigorated, inspired and invested into a form of medicine I believe is the best way to improve people's health. Harris and I were grateful to travel to Belize in Central America for our medical elective. Here we noticed an explosion in lifestyle diseases which is seen as common in developing nations. We hypothesised this was due to the high level of maize in the Belizean diet. But more likely, globalisation was offering high calorie fast food alternatives to the traditional jerk chicken, rice and stewed beans. 
It was in my solo trip to the fitness and lifestyle metropolis of Rio de Janeiro where I discovered herbal medicine and an alternative way of living. Every day I was being introduced to amazing foods I've never heard of before, such as the acai berry, guaraná, and traditional yerba mate. The Brazilians and Argentinians I met raved about these foods, and I was honoured to be invited into a mate circle, a sort of social tea ceremony, to relax, share jokes, and discuss lifestyle advice with one another. I couldn't believe the contrast of the culture in the UK, where meeting up with friends on a late evening usually involves at least a few beers. Athletes such as Lionel Messi and biohackers like Tim Ferriss all attest to Mate's benefits, finding it a non-addictive, crash-free coffee alternative. I delved into the science back in my hostel room and the papers reported anti-obesity, anti-diabetic and cholesterol-lowering effects. Astounded, I quickly researched the superfood acai and the guarana berry. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Acai beats blueberries and cranberries for antioxidant potential and maintains memory and learning functions in the hippocampus. The seeds of the guarana plant contain four times as much caffeine than the coffee bean, making it the most rich caffeine plant in the world. I came back to the UK with an amazing time and a new lease of life, inspired by the knowledge that was shared by my newfound friends. But before we get carried away with our newfound interests, we had to complete our medical degrees. And this meant back to the library, back to the clinics and back to the hospital wards. And annoyingly for us, back to exams. The slot continued, but with a lot of blood, sweat and tears, the job was done. And we had completed our degree. We were elated that we finally had the privilege to call ourselves doctors and start working. We started our new jobs as junior doctors and boy was it hard. Medical school had given us the knowledge required to diagnose and treat. What it hadn't taught us was how to tiptoe through the bureaucracy of working within such a big organisation as the NHS. No surprise as global warming with the state of the ancient NHS computers or volume of paperwork we use every day. There was something else that disturbed us even more than the crumbling NHS IT systems and we were seeing it every day. The majority of the patients we were treating had conditions that were related to unhealthy things they were doing as part of their lifestyle. Some of these unhealthy habits are obvious. Chronic stress, little to no physical activity, and a nutrient deficient diet. Others, less so. Poor sleep quality, mouth breathing, lack of hobbies, passions, or meaning in one's life. Combine all of those risk factors and you have a disaster waiting to happen. Modern society has sadly now accepted that as you get older, you will likely develop heart disease, fatty liver, diabetes, high blood pressure, joint pain, and mood disorders. The hospitals and GP practices are full with patients with chronic disease that could be limited with a focus on lifestyle medicine. Prevention is always better than cure. The NHS is an amazing service for acute problems, but for the chronically diseased, or mental health conditions, it lags behind many of its European counterparts. Waiting lists for operations or clinic appointments are growing at a rate that just isn't sustainable. So what is the answer? By chance, one day I was listening to a podcast with a guy who had spent his whole life studying the medicinal properties of mushrooms. He talked about one in particular called lion's mane. At the time, I knew nothing about medicinal mushrooms. But when this guy talked about how his research had demonstrated that lion's mane promoted neurogenesis, that is, the growth of new neurons, my mind was proverbially blown. I had to check whether what he was saying was true. What started as a brief mention on a podcast became so much more. The evidence was irrefutable. Indeed, this scientist was right. You see, lion's mate stimulates NGF1, which is a neutrophic factor, and this stimulates the generation of neurons. Added to that, it's also shown to protect oxidant-damaged neurons. Immediately, I thought about the growing population of people in this country with neurodegenerative conditions, such as dementia or Parkinson's disease. Modern medicine can help to slow down the progression of these conditions and alleviate some of the symptoms. But as of yet, there is no treatment that is considered curative. Could something so simple as a mushroom be used to help improve brain function? 
And to take it further, could there be a time in the future where lion's mane mushroom is used prophylactically to prevent the development of cognitive impairment? We were both astounded that we had gone through all of medical school without being taught about the medicinal properties of herbs, spices and food. But by now the ignition had been lit and we weren't going to stop. We were finding so much evidence on using food to heal the brain. So naturally we began to think, could there also be evidence for other body systems? The answer was yes. I looked into the heart, the engine of the body. I'd worked in the cardiology department so I'd seen many cases of heart disease, heart failure, high blood pressure and heart attacks. These patients would be placed on multiple medications lifelong, most of which carried common side effects. My research uncovered many nutraceuticals that benefit the heart. One of the more traditional plants was Hawthorne, which has a long-standing history as a tonic for the heart. It works well to reduce blood pressure and arrhythmias. High blood pressure in particular is terrible for our health leading to several debilitating diseases like strokes, heart disease and kidney damage. Another was saffron, which I found had evidence reporting an antiplatelet and blood pressure lowering effect. Then we looked at the gut and found a treasure trove of data. I discovered the devastating effects the common western diet, filled with ultra processed and nutrient deficient foods is having on our gut. It has now been proven that heavy meat and refined carbohydrate diets increase the risk of colorectal cancer, while plant-based diets decrease this risk. To heal this damage, we learnt about fermented foods and the wonderful medicinal properties they have. Every body system we looked at had a huge amount of evidence for the use of nutrition as a medicine. Adding to this evidence was another point that interested me, which is the low side effect profile relative to conventional medications. Commonly, I would see patients on so many medications they couldn't even remember all the names of them. Could we reduce the number of medications someone was on by improving their diet and using herbs, spices and plants to do this? The more we researched, the more we realised that we couldn't stand by and do nothing. So we thought long and hard how we could get the information we were learning out to more people. We would speak to patients at work and explain the medicinal properties of herbs and spices. We would tell them about how important food was to improve their well-being. But ultimately, this was a slow and inefficient method of educating people. So we created the Herbal Docs, an educational resource providing evidence-based guidance on nutrition and lifestyle medicine. Our mission statement is by making small changes and developing healthy habits, you can live a happy life. We'll be completely honest by admitting it's been a challenge balancing clinical work, postgraduate studies, hobbies and developing this resource. We didn't have a clue what we were doing when we started and it took concentration to learn how to code for features on our website. It took effort to get over my camera shy persona and the question we kept asking ourselves was, was it all worth it? And the answer is absolutely yes. To see friends, family and strangers improve their health by making small changes is a rewarding manifestation of what we work for. Here are some accounts of patients and athletes alike who have been impacted by working with the Herbal Docs. All right, Herbal followers, it's Mohamed Ali, professional boxer and GV 2016 Olympian. The Herbal Docs have recommended a supplement plan for me to naturally increase my testosterone levels and ensure my brain is working as fast as it can. Small changes, healthy habits, a happy life. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm currently trained to be a high performance athlete in the sport of football. And I've been working with the Herbal Docs for over a year now to improve all aspects of my health and fitness. Before this, I wasn't taking my diet or health seriously. I used to live the party lifestyle, binge drinking every weekend, and my diet consisted of processed foods and takeaways. First of all, I was recommended Lion's Mane and Bacopa Monieri. I found by taking these herbs, my agility and decision making on the pitch has improved. By incorporating herbs and spices into my daily routine, alongside lifestyle changes, I feel sharper on the pitch and recovery is much faster. Small changes, healthy habits, happy life. Hi, my name's Hibber and I'm a second year dental student. 
I've really been enjoying the content that the Herbal Dogs have been producing and I've been learning about how spices, plants and herbs can all improve my well-being. So my mum's been cooking with turmeric all my life and she makes some turmeric drinks as well and I've never really understood the science behind it. So I've really been enjoying finding out how it works and the pathways it does so. So using herbs and spices has really improved my well-being, um, both physical and mental, and this is really important for me as a second year dental student so that I'll be able to study for long hours and also be sharper when seeing patients as well. Small changes, healthy habits and happy lives. Thank you Herbal Docs. We've connected with so many amazing people and organisations on this journey. We have interacted with a variety of people which include biohacking authors, herbalist bodybuilders, and perhaps most importantly, patients. Only in the last month have we been asked to consult for companies who have developed their own health products at world famous health, nutrition and sports conferences. We are only just beginning to uncover the vast amount of knowledge available to us about plants and their use in medicine. Expect the herbal docs to continue on the same trajectory, discovering new plant medicines from around the world, sharing this knowledge with our valued subscribers and repeating our mantra. Small changes, healthy habits, happy lives. Thank you.